The next wife of the Prophet is Zainab bint Khuzayma. Zainab, the daughter of Khuzayma. She was previously married uh, before the Prophet twice. Her second husband died at the Battle of Bed, and so the Prophet wanted to honor her and the martyrdom of her husband, he married her because she lost her husband at a very important battle in Islam, the first major battle bed, <coughs> so she became widowed. So the Prophet ﷺ, to take care of her and to honor their sacrifice and to honor the martyrdom of her husband, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, married her. Previously she was mentioned according to some historians, a man, she was married to a man by the name of Tufayl ibn al-Harith ibn al-Muttalib, he divorced her, then she married his brother Ubaid ibn al-Harith ibn al-Muttalib, these are cousins of the Prophet, and then Ubaid if you remember we talked about Bad, he got wounded and killed at the battle of Bad, so the Prophet ﷺ married her, she was known to be a very virtu virtuous woman, in fact her title was Umm al-Masakeen, what does Umm al-Masakeen mean? the mother of the destitute of the very impoverished ones and so she would constantly feed the poor, she would constantly um, give charity to the poor even during the days of Jahiliya by the way, even before Islam she was known to be very charitable, however she did not stay long with the Prophet, after the Prophet married her within a few months uh, she passed away, some historians state eight months, eight months after being married to the Prophet, uh, she passed away. So the Prophet married her in year three of the Hijrah and she passed away in the year four of the Hijrah, he married her according to this historical account in Ramadan, the month of Ramadan, year three of the Hijrah, she passed away in the month of Rabi'a al-Thani, Second Rabi', year four of the Hijrah. Some historians have mentioned that the dowry that the Prophet gave her when he married her was 400 dirhams. A dirham is a silver coin. Not exactly sure how much that is in today's value, maybe $500, $600, you know, some, some an amount along these lines. So the Prophet ﷺ, he prayed on her, the Salat of the dead, and she was buried in the Baqi'ah. Historians mention that she was pretty young when she died, she was only 30, she was 30 when she died and she's the only wife after Lady Khadija to have died during the life of the Prophet, all other wives they died after the Prophet except Lady Khadija and uh, Zainab bint Khuzayma, she also died during the lifetime of the Prophet so she was known to be a decent and virtuous woman, there's not much known about her biography, we don't have accounts you know about her life, about her dealings with the Prophet or other incidents or hadiths because remember she just spent a few months with the Prophet and she passed away, so not much is known about her other than the accounts that we have that she was charitable and that she was a decent woman. Any questions about Zainab bint Khuzayma? Now her mother was Hind bint Auf ibn Zuhair, Hind the daughter of Auf, the son of Zuhair. Hind, according to some historians, was also the mother of Maymuna bin al Harith. Maymuna bin al Harith is another wife of the Prophet that now we're going to discuss. Another wife of the Prophet that he married was Maymuna bin al Harith bin Hazan. Her father was al Harith ibn Hazan. He came from the Hilal tribe in Mecca. Her mother was Hind bint Auf, she came from the Himyar tribe of Yemen. So her father was Meccan, her mother was Yemeni. She was the last wife of the Prophet to marry him, the last woman to be with the Prophet and she gifted herself to the Prophet. Hence Allah revealed verse 50 of Surah Al-Ahzab, um, confirming that this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala approves of, approves of, we'll talk about that. Initially her name was Barra, but the Prophet gave her a beautiful title, the Prophet would call her Maymuna, 
In Arabic, what does Maymuna mean? The word Maymun in Arabic comes from which word? You're getting close. Yameen, just delete one Ya. Yumn. It comes from the word, word Yumn. What does Yumn mean? Yumn, not Yom. Ya, Mim, Noon. Yumn. What does Yumn mean? Basically, if in English, if we want to translate it, it means blessings. You know, baraka, blessings, khair, good, abundance. That's the meaning of yum. And yameen is very similar because the right side in Islamic literature is blessed, right? So the idea of blessed is embedded. So the Prophet would call her the blessed one. See how much respect he would uh, show to her. She was also previously married. Uh, before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, she was married to Mas'ud ibn Umair al thaqafi he got separated from her, then she married Abu Raham ibn Abdul Uzza, he died, then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam married her. What do you notice one thing about these wives of the Prophet? They were divorcees, right? What does that tell us? This is a very important point my dear brothers and sisters that I'd like to share with you. Today in a lot of societies, we find that people in society, they stigmatize a divorcee woman. If a woman is divorced, they look at her differently. They judge her, right? Whereas Islam does not stigmatize a woman who's divorced. See Zainab bint Khuzayma was married twice before the Prophet. Um, Maymuna was married twice. Yes, the first one divorced her, the second one died, but the first one divorced her, so she was a divorcee. Yet the Prophet, who's a role model, who's the greatest creation of God, he marries women like that. What message is he sending us? Don't judge this woman. Don't stigmatize them just because they're divorced. Islam in those times did not consider divorce an impediment from marrying someone. Today, oh no. A divorced lady, uh, sometimes you hear from sisters who struggle, it's very sad. I constantly hear this, you know, uh, from people in the community that a sister says, you know, if I'm divorced, then there are men in the community, they look at me like trash. They look at me as if I have no honor. In fact, even one sister said, I was getting to know someone after a previous divorce. I wanted to get to know someone formally and get engaged and then get married. So I told this person that, uh, you know, please come to my father's house and let's formally meet. He's like, no, let's go out. Let's go out and meet. I'm like, well, you know, I'm, I'm not too comfortable. There's no engagement yet. So come, let's meet. And then we have the Ketbik Tab, the engagements, then we can go out. He's like, but you're already divorced. Why are you putting these conditions? And he made her feel cheap. This exists in the community. I tell you that. Just because she's divorced, she's now easily accessible. Uh, in the eyes of some men or she has less honor or she can't now put any conditions. Islam rejects this my dear brothers and sisters. The Prophet Sallallahu the symbol of our humanity, our role model, he would marry women like that to tell us don't stigmatize them. They're just as uh, good as any other woman. The example that you just gave Sayyidina, I mean, isn't there something innately wrong with the person who is looking at her as a divorcee and you just want to go out with her? Yeah, there's something wrong with him, but why does he think that he can get away with that? His philosophy was, well, you're a divorcee, so you should have less limits. See, see, see the stigma? In the eyes of some people, automatically, if you're a divorcee, you have less honor. Why? If these girls and women had less honor, why is the Prophet marrying them? So I want you to notice something about these wives of the Prophet, that most of them were divorcees, sometimes twice. Yet the Prophet married them. And the Prophet was breaking these barriers that don't stigmatize a divorcee woman and say, no, she's any less than any other woman. No, she could be better than most women. In fact, the divorcees of the Prophet, those wives were better than uh, that wife that was uh, not a divorcee. Yes, and, and history praises them for their virtues. So keep that in mind. And I think this is something the communities really need to uh, reflect upon these days because it's a growing problem.
It's really, really a growing problem. I think it's a growing pro problem all over Salem because there are just not the proper avenues that people have brainstormed about how to make that situation ready for folks, whether it is a divorcee or a single person or whomever. They don't know how to deal with that. They just don't know how to deal with just bringing people together overall. And what drives that would be society and what are the societal norms here in the West. So, But, but, but what, what surprises me, I'll be very honest with you, here in Muslim communities, is that Western American society, right, uh, does not stigmatize a divorcee that much. It's pretty common here in America to get remarried, isn't it? Or it, it, there is a stigma. No, it's, it's, minor. Very minor. it's very minor, not like it is in our culture. In our culture, <clears throat> if a woman gets divorced in some parts of the Middle East, that's it. She could say goodbye to dreaming of marriage. Why? Or if she's a widow, she has to be uh, stuck in her house, mourn her husband for life. Why? The Prophet is marrying widowed woman. Maimuna was a widow. Her husband died, her second husband. Um Salama was a widow. Zainab, her husband died at bed. She was a widow. Why is the Prophet marrying a widow if it's bad, if it's not good? But you see the problem in our culture is we've moved away from Islam. And that's why we have problems. I've been in societies where if a woman, even if she's young, believe me if she's 20, if she's 25 and her husband dies, that's it. It's shameful for her to consider marriage again. She just has to shut up for the rest of her life. If she expresses to her family her interest in getting remarried, I shame, where are you getting this from? This is the messenger of Allah, he's marrying widowed women, so what? Unfortunately, you have that ignorance in, in a lot of our culture. Yes, brother. I'll do you one worse. In our culture, you, you even think about marrying, not even marrying a divorce, inviting them to the wedding. No, no, that's bad luck. You want that to happen to the bride. So marrying a divorcee to your wedding is bad luck. No, no, no. Inviting them to the wedding. Yeah, inviting a divorcee to your wedding is bad luck. Yeah, but don't, don't even... Look, at uh, Look at the ignorance. Look at the ignorance. Yeah, exactly. Isn't that tragic? That inviting a divorced woman is now bad, just inviting them, see? So I, when I say there's a stigma, believe me, there's a big stigma in our communities when it comes to divorced women. They're, they're just treated differently, they're viewed differently. Why? This is the Prophet of Allah. Most of the wives that he had, and these are good wives by the way. Maymuna is a good woman, Um Salam is a good woman, Zainab is a good woman, they were divorcees. Yet the Prophet married them, he never made an issue out of it. Now. Maimuna was uh, related to a number of notable individuals. For instance, one of her sisters was Umm al-Fadl, the wife of Al-Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet Her other sister was the mother of Khalid ibn al-Walid. So Khalid ibn al-Walid, Maimuna becomes his aunt, his khala. And also Ibn Abbas, the son of Abbas, Maimuna is his aunt, his khala. We also find that Zainab ibn Khuzayma, the other wife of the Prophet, Asma ibn Umais, the wife of Ja'far, the brother of Imam Ali alayhi salam, and she later became the wife of Abu Bakr then, the wife of Imam Ali alayhi salam, and also the wife of Hamza, the uncle of the Prophet, they were her sisters as well from her mother's side. So we see that she was related to a number of these notable uh, women. In one hadith, the Prophet ﷺ praises Maymuna and she's considered a believer. So in one hadith, the Prophet says, Maymuna, Umm al-Fadl, who's Umm al-Fadl? The wife of Abbas. And Asma bint Umais, and the wife of Hamza, Akhawatun Mu'minat, they are believing sisters. So this is testimony from the Prophet ﷺ that these were good women. Who narrates this? Al-Haythami in his book, Majma' al-Zawa'id, which is a Sunni source, and a number of other um, sources. How did Maymuna get married to the Prophet? That's a point of discussion. In the seventh year of the Hijrah, the Prophet ﷺ, along with his companions, he entered Mecca, right? the year of the conquest uh, of Mecca, and they went to do Umrah al-Qadha. 
The qada of the Umrah. Question, why were they doing the qada of the Umrah? This is year seven. The Prophet and the companions, they entered Mecca to do the qada of a Umrah. Why? Not Khaybar, think of a treaty, Hudaybiyah. At Hudaybiyah, what happened? The pagans blocked Muslims from entering Masjid al Haram to fulfill their Umrah. So the next time the Prophet came to Mecca to do the Umrah, it became known as what? Umrah al Qada. The Qada of the Umrah that they didn't let us. So in the seventh year of the Hijrah, the Prophet came with a massive amount of Muslims. Maymuna, when she saw the greatness of the Muslims and she saw the glory of the Prophet and she really came to see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him victory, she signaled to her sister Umm al-Fadl, Umm al-Fadl is the wife of al-Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet. She told her sister Umm al-Fadl that, you know, I'm, I'm so inspired by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and I would be interested in marrying him. Maymuna says this, Umm al-Fadl tells her husband Abbas, Abbas is the uncle of the Prophet, he goes to the Prophet, he tells him, Ya Rasulallah, my sister-in-law, my wife's sister, Maymuna, she's expressed interest in marrying you, and in fact, she would like to gift herself to you, we'll talk about what that means. So the Prophet said, okay, he sent Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, he had just come back from Habasha, and he tells Ja'far, go on my behalf, propose the khutubah. Go and propose on my behalf. As soon as Maymuna heard that the Prophet has agreed and he has sent someone to um, propose to her, she was on a camel. She said, Al ba'ir wa ma alayhi lillahi wa la The camel. And the one who's riding the camel, meaning herself, is for Allah and the Prophet. I gift myself to the Prophet. Allah sends which verse in the Quran? Verse 50 of Surah Al Ahzab. Allah is talking about the wives of the Prophet. Then Allah says, and if a believing woman gifts herself to the Prophet. There's a lot of controversy about what this verse means. What does it mean for a woman? to gift herself to the Prophet. A few points. Number one, there is no doubt that in Islam, a valid marriage, whether permanent or temporary, must have dowry. There is no marriage without a dowry. The dowry is a part of a marriage. So much so that if the husband and the wife don't agree on a dowry and they don't mention it in the marriage contract, it's still obligatory for the husband to make it available. This is called mahrul myth. See if they decide on a dowry, one dollar or ten thousand dollars, it's decided, they stick to it. What if the husband and the wife don't mention the dowry? Let's get married, they do the marriage contract, they make no mention of the dowry. What happens? We have to default to mahrul myth. What's mahrul myth? The average dowry, for a person like her in that society, what is the average dowry? 5,000? He has to guarantee 5,000. So the dowry is a part of marriage. You cannot have an Islamic marriage without dowry. That's the first point. The second point over here is, what is this verse talking about? If a woman gifts herself to the Prophet. A woman gifting herself to the Prophet means she asks for no dowry. She comes to the Prophet and she tells him, I would like to marry you, be your wife, but I ask for no dowry. So in other words, I gift myself to you. Accept me as your wife with no dowry. I'm your servant. In Islam, this is unacceptable for any man except the Prophet For any man, <laughs> there must be a formal marriage contract, and also dowry. Another difference in Islamic law for the marriage to be valid, special words have to be mentioned like zawajtu or ankahtu. These two words, I marry myself to you. The woman has to say it to the man, the man says, qabirtu, I accept. Accept the Prophet. 
If a woman comes to him and she tells him, I gift myself to you, he says, I accept the gift, she's his wife. <laughs> no, 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 this is only for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So many Mufassireen have stated this verse applies to Maymuna in Surah Al-Ahzab. Some others dispute that, they're like, yeah, Allah gave the Prophet this permission, but nobody actually became the Prophet's wife this way. Whereas no, a lot of Mufassirs say no. There is a verse in the Quran and we have historical evidence that Maymuna, she gifted herself to the Prophet, and the Prophet ﷺ accepted. Interestingly, when one of the wives of the Prophet uh, became his wife through this method of gifting herself, Aisha objected. اعترضت Aisha. Who narrates this? Qurtubi in his tafsir, Sunni tafsir. Listen to this, it's an interesting hadith. اعترضت Aisha فقالت ما بال النساء يبذلن أنفسهن بلا مهر. What's the matter? Women are coming to you without a dowry, they just gift themselves to you? فَنَزَلَتِ الْآيَةَ عَلَىٰ Allah revealed in the Qur'an, yes, if a woman gifts herself to the Prophet, that's acceptable in the eyes of Allah. Allah is making an exception for the Prophet. Okay, when the verse was revealed, and now Aisha saw this is divine intervention, God is saying, I approve of that. You know what she said to the Prophet? قَالَتْ عَائِشَةَ أَرَى اللَّهَ يُسَارُعُ فِي هَوَاكِ <laughs> what does this mean? She's like, I see that God, He quickly fulfills uh, what's in your interest, your desire. Like if you desire something, quickly Allah approves of it. In other words, she's like, why, does, why is God showing you so much attention and what your nafs desires, God immediately gives it to you. It's strong statement. Strong statements, you know, she's objecting to the Prophet or to Allah, I don't know, you choose which one. <laughs> <laughs> you know what the Prophet replied to her? فَقَالَ لَهَا النَّبِيُّ وَإِنَّكِ إِنْ أَطَعْتِ اللَّهَ سَارَعَ فِي هَوَاكِ Aisha, you also obey Allah, Allah will give you what you want. Who mentions this? Qurtubi, the Sunni scholar in his tafsir. <laughs> so Aisha was bothered by this. 